Welcome to the Money Mastermind Show. Let's talk money. Welcome to the Money Mastermind Show. Tonight, we're going to talk about traveling the world without going broke. To discuss that tonight is our Money Mastermind panel, and that is Miranda Marquid of Planting Money Seeds, Tom Drake of the Canadian Finance Blog, and also Kyle Prevo of youngandthrifty.ca, and um, Peter Anderson of Bible Money Matters. Those two guys couldn't make it tonight. Um, with us also is a special guest. We have Paula Pant of Afford Anything. Welcome to our show, Paula. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for coming. Um, before we start, if anybody out there is watching live, there is a Q&A app. And if you have any questions about traveling internationally and being able to afford it, please post those questions because we love to answer viewer questions. And, um, and that's that. So travel provides such great experiences that really last a lifetime. And especially when it's international travel and you're meeting up with different cultures and different peoples. Um, but I think a lot of people, myself included, think that international travel is really expensive. Um, is it that expensive? Is there a way to make it affordable? Mm -hmm. Can it be done? Yes, absolutely. So um, a little bit about my background. I traveled for two years on a budget, a total budget of $25,000. So I was traveling on an average of $1,000 a month. Um, and, uh, and there are a few primary ways that I did that. Number one, the biggest cost that a lot of people are going to face, especially in international travel, is airfare. Um, and the two best, three really best ways to reduce it, one is to fly using frequent flyer miles. Um, so if you are the type of person who can avoid going into credit card debt, and that's a big if, but if you can do that, then make all of your normal purchases, groceries, gasoline, it, you know, all of those on a credit card that gives you frequent flyer miles and, and you'll accumulate enough that that will cover the cost of your ticket. That's half the trip right there. Um, another good way to uh, lower the cost of airfare is just by not being that picky about where you go. Sometimes there are great last minute deals to a country that you've never thought that you wanted to go to. But if you can scoop up that deal, then you got it. For you can. My parents did that to fly to Paris for, I think, two hundred dollars or something like that. Um, and uh, and the third way is, and this isn't so much of a a cost lowering strategy as it is a more of a budgeting strategy. But the longer you spend in a particular destination, the lower your cost per day is. So if you're going to shell out for the airfare to Australia or New Zealand, um, you could shell out for that for a week trip, or you could, you know, shell out for that for a month trip. So, yeah, if that, yeah. that might be a decent start to your question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's just jump, I guess, more into the, the more advanced stuff. Um, you're saying the longer you stay, the cheaper it'll be today. Um, I think I could intuitively think, uh, based on my own travel, why that would be. Um, but if you can tell our viewers and listeners why that would be the case. Like, Why is it the longer you're there, the cheaper it ends up being? Sure. Well, first of all, a huge part of traveling is uh, eaten up by just the cost of getting there and getting around. So airfare, ground transportation, uh, bus, basically buses, trains, airplanes, those soak up a huge piece of your budget. So um, the longer you spend in any given place, the less of that you need, especially when it's averaged out on a per day basis. Um, also, if you're in a particular place for a long time, you're likely to be in an environment where you have access to a kitchen, which means that you can cook your own meals, um, which spares you from the cost of dining out. And finally, you also just get to know some of the local cost-saving things that, that locals know. like. Um, You'll know where to find the those streets where you can find free parking. You'll know those just those tiny little details that um, that you catch on to once you're in an area for a while. So when you're staying somewhere, uh, when you're saying about a kitchen, are you talking about the type of thing of instead of getting a, a luxury hotel room that maybe you're renting out an apartment or you're getting um, an, an alternative type of um, hotel maybe where it's just a longer stay type of deal? 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. And there are a couple of different options. You can rent out an apartment or an entire house, and you can do that on uh, websites like Airbnb or VRBO or HomeAway.com or FlipKey.com. Um, alternately, you could just stay with, do a homestay. So Couchsurfing.org is a great site where you stay for free with a host um, as just sort of a cultural exchange type of a thing. Uh, you could, uh, if you, especially in countries in um, some of the cheaper countries to travel in, like in South America or Asia, uh, you can just go there. You don't need to use a website. Just go there, and once you arrive in a city, maybe go check into a hostel or a guest house for the first night or two, and then look at renting out a house. There will be you'll find people once you get there. Like we went to Bali with nowhere to stay, no plan. Our first night there, we rented a, a guest house for 12 bucks a night. And then the next day, we just started asking around, and we found a woman who was willing to rent us a house in the hills for two months for, I think the cost averaged out to, like, I think it came to about 300 a month or something like that for this beautiful two-story home. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit it, and I mean, even just here, um, the idea, I, and I've used Verbo before, mm -hmm. um, and it was great when I did it, but even here, the idea of staying at somebody else's house mm -hmm. is pretty scary. So overseas, um, where there might be different language and all sorts of different cultures, that seems like a pretty kind of spooky thing. Mm -hmm. um, don't be spooked. I mean, the, the best way to overcome a fear is just to face it, give it a shot, you know. Uh, what's great about uh, websites like couchsurfing.org, which, which is where you do that homestay for free, is that people write review, guests write reviews of hosts, and hosts write reviews of guests. So you'll be able to go on there and see reviews that other uh, people who have stayed with those hosts have given them, and vice versa. You know, they'll be able to review you too, because from their perspective, how do they know that you're not the creepo? Um, and so it, it works both ways. And the more you use it, the more of those positive reviews that you get. And they also sync with, you know, um, your your friends and your Facebook account and and all of that. So the more social proof that you have on the internet, the more people can see that you're just a, an average person. So one of the things that kind of uh, gives me a little bit of pause is I have a family. <laughs> so, and that's, um, I mean, and, and for me it's really not that big a deal because my husband doesn't like to travel, but my, and my son does. And so my son and I can just sort of take off and do whatever. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, I'm kind of interested. I know Tom's managed some vacations uh, with his family, and so, so is uh, so is Glenn. I'm just kind of, I mean, what do you do if you have to take the whole family? For taking an entire family, uh, you might have a harder time finding a place on a website like Couchsurfing, but for some, for a situation like that, Airbnb, VRBO, uh, just showing up somewhere and then renting a guest house while you're there, like the, the Bali example that I cited, those are actually ideal for families. Um, I think much more so than a hotel, because hotels aren't really conducive to to traveling with the family. You've got a cram, you've got one room where everyone in the entire family is crammed into that one bedroom. Whereas if you rent a house or rent an apartment, you'll have multiple bedrooms, you'll have a living room. So it's it's much better for maintaining that family structure. I know the time we use Verbo and this is important. Um, the whole time once we got off the plane till we actually showed up and got the key to get into the place, we were just wondering, like, please be legit, please be legit. <laughs> please open up, please be there. And uh, you know, we finally opened it up and we got in and we were like, ah, oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and it was awesome. Um, it, was, it was a great place that we stayed at. But there was a, you know, we'd never done anything of that sort before outside of just a, getting a hotel room. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was a great benefit because like you said, it had a kitchen and it was a, a good uh, headquarters for us to stay without having to run into a hotel every time. Um, it reduced the expense of having to pay the, the daily fees for a hotel or a motel. We, we had meals there. I mean, it was really like having a home away from home. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It does give you that home away from home experience. So, um, And, the, you know, the great thing about reviews is that you can you can make sure that that the peop that it's going to be legit, that people will be there and the check-in process will be smooth and the place will be clean. Um, and uh, 
you know, if, if a place has some good reviews, then give it a shot. Like, what's the worst that can happen? There will be some dust on the coffee table? I mean, that's, that's, that's what I'm worst case scenario. That's worst that can happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I'm thinking, like, Midnight Express, like, worst that can happen. <laughs> you checked into a, a really small hotel once. We got there, and there was, like, curdled milk sitting in the ice bucket thing, and... Uh, it was clear the sheets hadn't been washed. We were like laying on the top of the coverlet, and it was just skeevy. So I can't imagine that. Like, I mean, this was and this was a this was a hotel. <laughs> so, like, I can't imagine that it's yeah. I can't imagine that it would be worse than that. So <laughs> that's a good point. I've seen some pretty bad hotels too. So. Glenn, um, how much do you did you pay when you went to Portland? Just an idea of how how much cheaper that is, even within the states. Uh. I'd have to go back. I mean, I, it could have been a thousand a week, and we shared that with friends too. Um, mm -hmm. Compared to paying a, a nightly uh, hotel rate, that would have been at least a hundred or so a night, you know. Um, and on top of that, it was like a really nice, like three floor townhouse, you know, full of amenities, washer and dryer, kitchen and whatnot. Okay. Just the idea of being able to make meals with my family sounds way better than taking them out to the restaurant three times a day. So that's, I'm already uh, interested. <laughs> and it depends on what you're looking for and where you're going also, I'm sure. Um, so let's go back uh, back in the beginning before we start running off anywhere and, um, and putting stuff on our credit cards to get points. Um, how do we even think about budgeting it? You said you, you were gone for two years and, and you had $25,000. How did you... How did you plan it out? How much planning went into that? Or did you just kind of wing it and you had a certain amount of money? Did you know that you were going to spend a certain amount in different places? Yeah, I, I totally winged it, to be honest. I started with a one-way ticket to Cairo, Egypt, and absolutely no plans from that point forward. Um, so I didn't even know where I was going to end up, where I was going to be, and that was intentional. I, I intentionally didn't plan because a big um, goal of the trip was to see what would happen if I set out with um, completely unencumbered, no responsibilities, no plans. Um, what would that level of freedom look like? Where would it lead? Uh, and so that was a goal of the journey. Um, and so I, I did know, I guess my one limitation was that I knew that I had a $25,000 budget and I knew that I wanted to make this stretch for as long as possible. And right from the beginning, my goal was to be on the road for two years without working. Um, and so Obviously, but just being able to do simple math, I knew that uh, that meant that I could spend about a, a grand a month. And um, in order to do that, I would have to stick around in countries where the dollar exchange rate really worked in my favor. So I started out in Egypt. Now, this is before the, uh, the Arab Spring Revolution, when Egypt was um, in a different position than it is right now. So I started out in Egypt. I spent about six weeks there, went to Israel for a week. And then, um, and then went to India from there, and then traveled all around. I did the entire uh, that traditional traveler circuit of going to India and Nepal, and then across over to Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, and all of these places that I'm naming are places where the dollar really works in your favor. If you're lucky enough to be able to earn in dollars and spend in um, Thai baht or Laotian kip, your your money just goes a lot further. So even um, in places like that, like in Laos, I didn't cook a single meal for myself. I was eating out three times a day um, and doing the perpetual, like ordering lattes, or in, in my case, iced coffees, just loads and loads and loads of those a day. And it, it costs nothing. So I have two thoughts there. One, mm -hmm. uh, are there any passport issues when you do something like that, when you don't have an intentional uh, destination? And you uh, just show up and you got, okay, here I am. Anything, did you ever come across any issues with that? Uh, so if you have a U.S. citizenship, then the world is really open to you. I used to be a Nepalese citizen. And back when I had a Nepali passport, it was very hard to go anywhere because uh, even a tourist visas to places like, like London and um, England get denied if you have a passport from, um, from a country like Nepal or um, or Pakistan or something like that. But if you're lucky enough to have a U.S. citizenship, you're you're really in a good spot. Um, you do have to like take the five minutes to go online and just Google like 
Malaysia visa requirements US citizen. And it'll tell you right there exactly what you need to do. And sometimes you just have to like have your act together enough to apply for a visa 30 or 60 days in advance and pay a few dollars. Um, but yeah, if, if you're lucky enough to be from the US, you're, you're in a great spot. So a little planning might help you out in, in just clearing any visa issues and, and such. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like for Australia, for example, you need to apply in advance for a visa. You can't, you can't just go there and get a visa on arrival. Um, if with, for Indonesia, at the time that I went, you could, you could go there and get a visa, a 90-day visa on arrival. Um, so yeah, every country's got different requirements. India, you need to get a visa in advance, and that one's a little bit more complicated. You actually have to mail in your passport um, to the uh, to the embassy. Uh, Myanmar, you have to get a visa in advance. So yeah, but I mean, it's not hard to do. You just need to go to the embassy or fill out an online application, depending on which country you're going to. And, and about how long does it take to get these visas? It depends. Again, it depends on the country. Like I said, some countries have visa on arrival. So Costa Rica, um, visa on arrival. You just show up and they stamp your passport at the airport. Uh, for other countries, like for uh, for Myanmar, for example, um, it, they they did it the day that you applied, but you had to go there in person to make the application. Um, and then for other places like India, you know, you have to actually physically mail them your passport, and it can take. A, as long as a couple of months, so um, you know, That's just something. I, I, India is like before you go anywhere, make sure you have that set. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, before you go anywhere, just just Google it. Like all the information's online, and for the vast majority of places, you're not going to have any issues at all. You plan a couple, like a just a month or even a couple of weeks in advance. The one issue that we did have actually was with Australia. We had applied for. Uh, for one year tourist visas to Australia and our visa in Indonesia was expiring because we were we were running up on our it was a 60 day or a 90 day limit I don't remember which but we were running up on that limit that visa was expiring we hadn't gotten our visa to Australia yet so we were at that last minute bind and we had to we legally had to leave Indonesia so we booked a last-minute flight on AirAsia.com, which is a low-cost carrier. Booked a last-minute flight to uh, Kuala Lumpur, and just waited it out there until we got our Australia visa. Um, that was the one and only issue that we that we had, you know. Um, and again, that's totally different from from the situation that you'd be in if you had a passport from <laughs> from Nepal, where you'd have to like go in for an interview and answer questions about why you want to go there and how long you plan to be there and all of that, you know. Um, it's definitely nothing like that. It's not nearly that bad. So, <laughs> oh. Sorry. Wait, let me spit this one out. Okay, so go. How do, you, how do you work the mail? So like you said, you had to go to Kuala Lumpur to get, and then to get that Australian visa. So how do they know, okay, wait a minute, we're not sending it to the first place. We're going to send it to the second place. Oh, that, that was totally online. The only place that I ever actually had to deal with a, with postal mail was applying for India's visa. Okay. Okay. That was, that was what I was going to ask. <laughs> how, that, how that works when you're like going all over the place. The technology is wonderful. You know, I did once have the situation where I ordered what were supposed to be e-airline uh, e tickets, like airline tickets that were delivered electronically, which is what we all... And, and uh, the description of the ticket said that it was an e-ticket, that it could be issued electronically, but then after I pressed the buy button, um, they were like, sorry, this is paper ticket only. And then they mailed it to my home address in the United States. <laughs> so, um, so for that, I just had to get my parents to FedEx it to the FedEx location in, uh, I think I was in either India or Indonesia at that time. But they FedExed it to the FedEx office, and the FedEx office held it for me. And then I could just go there and pick it up from that FedEx office. Oh, wow. <laughs> I actually did that a couple of times. We had a, our MacBook cable got stolen once, and we were on this remote island in the middle of nowhere. We had no, that, like, there was no Apple store. So we just had one FedExed to us. No Amazon drones yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it does help to sometimes have a, a person at your home base that you can rely on in case uh, something does come up. 
Yeah, yeah, it totally does. <laughs> so my other question here is, um, how do you deal with money in the different exchanges as you're going along, are you using credit cards all along? Do you use traveler's checks? Are you exchanging your money into the native currency of each country you're going into? Mm -hmm. How do you organize all of that? Uh, that's a great question. So the the two things that I do are um, use. I have an an ATM uh, card that has no ATM fees, and that's through Charles Schwab Bank. Um, Schwab has no ATM fees, and if another bank charges you an ATM fee, they will actually reimburse that uh, fee back to your account. So, so even internationally? Yes. Yes, you can withdraw money from any ATM anywhere in the world without a fee. Um, so you, Charles Schwab is your debit card. And then uh, for my credit card, I have a card with the two things, two very important things. One is that it has no foreign transaction fees. And the other is that uh, it has what's called chip and pin technology. And uh, credit cards with chip and pin technology are much more likely to be accepted at foreign merchants. Now, that being said, don't assume that you, credit cards will be accepted in the country that you're in. If you're in a developed country, a nation like places in Europe, you've got a higher likelihood that they're going to accept credit cards in in some but not all of the, the shops and restaurants. But if you're in Cambodia, no one's really swiping plastic there. So, um, so be prepared to, to make a lot of cash purchases. But you're doing those cash purchases. Um, you're hitting the ATM and then doing what you do. Yeah, yeah. So if you just go to the ATM in the country that you're traveling in, they'll, of course, give you uh, local currency. And, and you ever get any intending issues where you're just stuck with a lot of money from that place and... and I mean, what would you do then? Do you have to go to a bank and then exchange it back out, or? Yeah, you could. You could go to a bank and exchange it back out. I try to avoid that because usually you you don't get a very good exchange rate when you do that. Um, and some banks will actually charge you a flat fee. Uh, uh, Wells Fargo, I believe, charges just a five dollar flat fee in addition to its bad exchange rate. Um, so you know you kind of want to avoid that. But uh, in the worst case scenario, you you pay five bucks and then get a bad exchange rate. So that's not so bad. But typically what will happen is that you you can kind of game out, you know, you know how much you're spending each day, and, you know, you can kind of game out how much to withdraw from the ATM. Well, and one of the things, mm -hmm. too, you can do, and what I've, <coughs> excuse me, what I've done in the past is, depending on where you're at, some of them may actually take your, your U.S. dollars and give you change back in the local currency. Mm -hmm. So if you're kind of running low or if you don't want to go back, make another trip, you can do that. But you have to be kind of good at math in your head because you don't want to, you don't want to wind up kind of, I guess, getting taken advantage of because yeah. they may not give you back the, uh, the right amount. Yeah. Uh, but it, but that's actually worked out really well for me in the past. Um, nice. But once again, like I said, I mean, it just, it helps to have a good idea of, of the, like you were saying, the exchange rate and what it's going to cost you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, the other thing that you can do, a lot of countries charge uh, exit fees. So a country might charge you 30 bucks to leave. And if you pay an exit fee, they generally will allow you to pay it either in the local currency or often they'll also allow you to pay it in U.S. dollars as well. So if you have some extra money left over, you can use it to pay that, you know, you can plan on paying the exit fee in U.S. dollars, and if you get to the end of your trip and have the extra money left over, then just spend it on the exit fee. How do you track all these different exchange rates from each country? I mean, obviously, once you get there, you can find out, but um, are you going online? Are there any apps that you're using to, to track all this stuff? Uh, there's a XE Currency is, a, is an app that allows you to, to know the exchange rate. But in, in terms of tracking, I mean, the, the quick and dirty way to do it is know what one U.S. dollar is worth. Uh, well, okay, there are a couple. Pick a few round numbers and know what they translate to. So, um, and you can do that either way. You can either think, all right, one U.S. dollar is worth X amount of kip, uh, 10 U.S. dollars is worth Y amount of kip, and use those as, like, benchmarks or milestones so that when you're looking at prices in a different currency, you can benchmark it to, oh, that's more than 10 but less than 20. Got it. 
you know. Yeah. Um, the, or you could do it in reverse. You could know that 500 kip is equal to X in U.S. dollars, or 5,000 kip is equal to Y in U.S. dollars, and you can benchmark it that way as well. Yeah, because I'd imagine, like, if you're just buying something at a store, it's kind of easy to figure out the rates and, and, and just work it out, but you really probably have to avoid um, all sorts of cons, like if you're in a cab and all of a sudden you're playing with rates and, and just knowing how to charge. Like, I mean, is, are there any tips on dealing with that? Or uh -huh. have you ever had to, to, to work with things of that sort? Oh, yeah. Yeah, dealing, dealing with scams. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that that goes on. Uh, negotiate hard. Uh, before you get into and don't go into a cab that has a meter. Um, negotiate a fixed rate. Uh, oftentimes, if you get out, like let's say you're at an Indian train station, there will be a whole bunch of cab cabbies that are waiting there for people who get off the trains. And <laughs> you can do functionally with a reverse auction where you're like, okay, will anybody take me for, and then you yell out a number and see if someone will take you for that number. You know, and so you pre-arrange that flat rate. And, you know, once you get to that final destination, they may still try to scam you. you you'll start to get out of the car, and they'll be like, oh, oh, I meant per person plus the bag fee. And you just have to be like, nah, man, no. <laughs> and, and I'm guessing, and this is what I've heard, but uh, I think in other countries, uh, it's a lot easier to negotiate across the board in different uh, different places. Is that the case? Yes. Yeah. In many pla in many countries, you negotiate for everything, ranging from uh, clothing to b meals to bottled water. I've I've even gone as far as to negotiate the price of bottled water before. So. <laughs> so it's worth it to start honing those skills before you head out, and and not to be afraid to to offer up a price. Yeah, you know, and that's one of the, the great skills that traveling teaches you. In, in America, often the only times that we negotiate are for the big things that matter, like our salaries, our houses, our cars, and we never really hone that skill. And so the few times that we need to do it, uh, we have no practice at it. Um, that's one of the great things that you can really develop as a traveler. So let's go back into, um, in, into budgeting. So for the average person, um, they want to travel internationally. Where do they start? How, how do you start to figure out how can I afford to travel to X? What do they need to do? What type of mindset do they need? Well, the, the first mindset, um, and the, this is sort of the backbone of my blog, is the idea that you can afford anything, but you can't afford everything. So if travel is actually a priority, if it's genuinely what you want to do, then you can afford to do that. Don't ever believe that you can't. It's just that you can't afford to travel and have a beautiful home and a beautiful car and designer clothes and designer handbags and, 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 and. You know, something's got to give. Um, so then you just you prioritize and decide what you're willing to give up in order to travel. Are you going to um, not go to the bar for for a couple of months, just just not purchase alcohol and see how much money you save doing that. Are you willing to, you know, shop at thrift stores? Are you willing to work a side hustle and bring in some extra cash in the evenings and weekends? Um, it's 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 kind of that the standard money saving advice. You know, you would you would apply the same mentality to getting out of debt or any other major financial goal. It's it's no different if you're using that to, for travel. And are there any tools? that you would suggest or have used to, to help build those priorities and that budget? So actually one of my one of my favorite tools, it's very old fashioned, uh, it's the classic envelope, a physical envelope. And th this is what I was doing when I was saving up to travel. I'd go to a grocery store and I'd walk through the store and I'd do my normal rounds of grocery shopping. And then at the very end, right before I hit the checkout aisle, I'd look at everything in my cart and put back a couple of optional items that I didn't need, like um, like those really like really fancy juice, like a wallet juice, you know, which I love. But you know, I I'd, I'd force myself to put it back, or I'd put back a bag of of chips or a bag of cookies, and then I uh, do a rough calculation in my head of the dollar amount of what I just put back. Like okay, I just put back twelve bucks worth of stuff. 
I would physically take twelve dollars out of an out of my wallet and put it in an envelope, and then I'd keep that envelope in the glove compartment of my car, which was not really the safest place to store it. Um, and over time, that actually added up to hundreds of dollars. So, um, so that was one of my favorite tools when I was when I was saving up for my trip. Sounds like you're really using the opportunity cost there, but maybe like in a in a reverse, like this is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. This is what I have in the back of my head, so I'm not going to do this, and then I'm going to put the money here instead. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, and so you're trading off one carton of orange juice at a time, and uh, and it's amazing how that that adds up. So back to um to the making the travel itself uh, less expensive. Can you go a little bit into um, how you might use your credit cards and such to, to get miles for for airline stays and such? Sure. Uh, first and foremost, put all of your spending, and there's a big caveat, only do this if you are not going to go into credit card debt. Um, if there's any chance that you're going to go into credit card debt, then stop listening to this part of the interview right now. <laughs> Um, oh, keep watching. <laughs> <laughs> Just put it on mute, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just in there for a little while, then come back. <laughs> um, but if you can avoid going into credit card debt, then first and foremost, put all of your normal daily spending on it. Everything from cartons of orange juice to uh, to your utility bills. Um, any anything, any spending that you do goes on goes on the credit card. Uh, Beyond that, there are a few more sophisticated ways that you could quote unquote hack your credit card for, uh, for to get additional miles. Like, um, for example, Amazon this Amazon just stopped this program, but until recently, you could transfer up to a thousand dollars per month to another recipient on Amazon using your credit card to fund that transfer. Oh, nice. Um, so without paying any additional fees. And so, uh, so that was a great way to just accumulate an extra twelve thousand frequent flyer miles a year. Um, I would transfer a thousand bucks per month to my boyfriend through my credit card through Amazon. Unfortunately, they just stopped the program, so now we're all searching for the next hack. <laughs> I think that's kind of where do you where do you go to find those hacks? Like, is there a, is there like a magical message board that you can go on or? Yeah. Yeah, there are many uh, travel hacking websites. So there's Frequent Flyer Talk, I believe, is one. Uh, NomadicMat.com uh, mm -hmm. is a, a travel blog that often talks about travel hacking. Um, uh, I, I sort of stay on the periphery of travel hacking. I tend to hear about the, the big opportunities, but I don't get really super nerdy about it. Um, but there are some very nerdy the the way that that some of us can be about personal finance is the way that some people are about travel hacking so uh you can you can if you go on those blogs you can really get a, a lot of mileage but uh, <laughs> out of your credit card <laughs> now are these standard airline points that you're earning that it go to a specific airline mm -hmm. or are these points that you're transferring to different places or is this like a case where some cards um you just earn rewards, and when you pay for an airline ticket, you get a statement of credit, let's say. Ah, so it, again, it depends on how sophisticated you want to be. There are some people who will accumulate a bunch of, of points on a chase card and then transfer it over to a British Airways. Um, and they've worked out some very elaborate system in which they can convert points to miles at a given rate and then convert that to this and the other. So it, it totally depends on how sophisticated you want to be. I've decided to sort of simplify everything for myself personally um, by consolidating all of my rewards onto one airline at a time. And so I'll just pick one airline. Right now it's American Airlines. And I put everything onto an American Airlines card. And I... Um, I just build my my miles on that one specific airline until I have enough for two round trip international uh, tickets. And once I've done that, then I redeem those miles, and then I look around at other credit cards and see who's giving the biggest sign up bonus. And I'll just go with whatever airline currently has the biggest sign up bonus because those bonuses can get you uh, really far ahead of the game. You know, U.S. Airways is giving 
40,000 bonus miles, or if you get a special offer from them, 50,000 bonus miles for a sign-up right now. American Airlines, until recently, was giving a 100,000-mile bonus. Um, so that's that's where I look around any time that I want to churn into a different card. So you're going airline mile card to airline mile card rather than maybe a Chase or an Amex card. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's what I'm doing. Um, I don't churn too frequently. A churn is a... a word that sort of talks about um, switching from card to card, can't, opening and closing cards. Um, again, I'm not as geeky about it as like super hackers are, but uh, I'll, I pick up a new credit card probably once every six months or so. Um, so uh, and, at, and at that time, I'll just go with whoever is giving the best sign-up deal at that time. So what I really like about what you're talking about is I like how you're like, I have this goal. I'm going to build up my miles till I have an international ticket. I really like that kind of mindset where you're looking at it and going, well, this is what I want to do and this is how I'm going to do it. And I really like this, you know, kind of, you don't have to have everything in your life planned out, but you can look at it and say, this is what I want and here is what I need to do and here are the steps. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good way to go about life and finances and everything. Thank you. Thank you. Do you find that that it translates well to international travel. Do you have any issues with these uh, reward miles maybe not being um, as generous for an international flight as they might be a domestic flight? Uh, the opposite, actually. The the best redemption that you can get from a, a credit card is international flights. And so my standard is uh, to try to redeem at a value of two cents per mile. So if you were to convert that into cash, that, that would be the equivalent of getting a 2% cash back or a 2% reward rate. Um, and oftentimes on international flights, if you if you calculate how many miles you're using and what the face ticket value of that is, you can redeem at two two cents a mile, two percent or greater. Um, it's hard to get that kind of redemption value on a domestic flight. But in general, mm-hmm. um, you're also probably the, the base ticket cost for an international flight might be more than a domestic flight. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it is kind of like a, a bit of a trade-off. I mean, that that 150 ticket to Florida versus mm-hmm. maybe the $800 ticket to Europe. So you might get a better um, translation in your points to the European tip ticket, but it's also going to cost you more. Yes, yes, exactly. You you spend more miles on that ticket, but you get a better redemption value for those miles. Um, but that being said, it takes longer to accumulate those miles. And, and I mean, just a just a a figure off the top of your head, like how many miles are we talking about in order to get a, a round t- uh, round trip ticket? On United, it, United has two different. They've got Saver and Standard. Saver is only certain tickets, certain dates. Those are the ones that I get, of course, because I'm frugal. Um, but a Saver ticket to Europe is sixty thousand round trip um, for Saver ticket economy class. Uh, to Asia, I think it's around forty to fifty thousand, um, and then to Africa. If you're flying to South Africa, is where you're gonna, or Sub-Saharan Africa, I should say, is where you're gonna spend the most miles. Um, and I believe that's somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think, around a hundred thousand to a hundred and twenty thousand uh, on United for Saver fare. Uh, that that's ballpark. Don't quote me on it. <laughs> oh, well, it's here, right here, on the record. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just good to know because you always hear right. how great yeah. it is to to get travel rewards and you get free tickets, and all of a sudden you get, you know, you get it in your mind that oh, this is what I'm going to do, and then when you go to redeem, redeem, and you go, well, I got ten thousand reward points. Where does that take me? And you know, it takes you to the next state, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, and that's one of the reasons I'd recommend look up that chart in advance. Look it up when you, the day that you open that credit card, and then you know what your goal is. And so, you know, just like if you're saving up for the down payment on a house or if you're trying to pay off your debt, you have, you start with a goal in mind and work backwards from there, and that way you can track your progress towards that goal. Do the same when you're trying to accumulate frequent flyer miles. Know that you've got a goal of, accumulating 120,000 frequent flyer miles, and then take it from there. And um, when you're traveling, you're not using these same cards, are you? Because I'm guessing a lot of these cards probably do have those foreign transaction fees on them. 
Some do, some don't, but I, I have one card that I use consistently that's my non-form transaction fee card. And, and just for, for everybody out there listening, mm -hmm. uh, a foreign transaction fee can easily be about 3%. Yes. That's just being tacked on to everything. 3% doesn't sound like a lot. Um, if you just buy in a magazine, it's not a lot. But when you put all your charges on a, a vacation while you're away, all of a sudden you're paying a hefty fee on top of everything else that you're, you're doing. Exactly, exactly. So any other, any other favorite travel hacks that you have um, besides you know, using points and um, maybe uh, staying at alternative uh, lodgings while you're away? Anything that's really worked well for you? I, you know, I would just say don't, don't overthink it. Um, you know, don't, don't try to plan it out too much. Uh, sometimes the more you pre-plan, the more, you know, and you try to book things in advance, um, sometimes the more expensive that can be. So just, uh, just, just get rule number one of, of traveling is just getting there. Um, and once you do that, you'll, you'll figure out the rest. So I'd say that's probably my, my biggest tip is, um, you know, don't, don't overplant too much. Uh, get, get to the country and once you've got boots on the ground, you'll get a much better sense of, um, the situation around you and, and how to best interact with it. And how about other travel logistics? Um, dealing with the language, um, just dealing with your own luggage and, and laundry and, and clothing, mm -hmm. um, health, driving, I mean, it, um, the language is really not a problem. If you can only speak one language, English is the one to speak. So uh, you're very fortunate to, to be able to speak English. Um, uh, you know, obviously, you'll learn, you know, you'll learn a few of the, the basic words. Hello, please, thank you. Um, you'll learn that. And that, that you'll pick that up naturally once you get there. You can, you know, look up a few of those before you go. But don't don't be too worried about it. Laundry, there will be services. You'll see, I mean, any service that, that travelers need, you're going to see advertised because there are going to be little mom and pop entrepreneurs that have realized that travelers need to do their laundry and they can charge you $2 or $3 to offer to do it for you. So, you know, you'll, you'll see, you'll see how to do that. That's not going to be a problem. Um, in terms of health, uh, so, sorry to go here. Bring a surplus supply of tampons with you uh, because sometimes those are really hard to find. Um, similarly, if you wear contacts or contact lens solution, bring a bunch of that with you because that can also be hard to find, especially if you're going to a really remote area. And make sure you don't, I guess you have to pack that all the way because uh, uh, you can only get that so much on, on your over, uh, on your bags on the flight, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if you're packing contact lens solution, you'll have to check a bag, unfortunately. But I mean, how how much do you actually travel with when you do something like this? So, like two years, um, how do you plan on on what clothes you're going to wear? Like, do you, do you have to have? A, I, I'm guessing you're thinking mm -hmm. you all warm weather places, and you're not. You know, you don't have one bag that has a parka in it, and the other one that has the bathing suits in it. <laughs> um, I I have a lot of quick dry layers. Um, but you know, don't pack too much. Like quick dry. The reason quick dry is so that you can hand wash things in the sink and then let it dry overnight. Um, and layers because it's versatile. You know, whether you're in a warmer or colder climate. Um, but don't overpack. There's there's a saying: lay out all your clothes and all your money, and then bring half the clothes and twice the money. <laughs> so. So um, we're kind of winding down here, I think, mm -hmm. and um. What's uh what's a couple of the places you've uh your favorite places that you've gone in your endeavors? Inside the United States, I love I love Southern Utah. I think it's uh one of the gems of the U.S. Um, cool. <laughs> Utah as well. <laughs> and uh, so the the whole Southwest of the U.S. is just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it's my one of my favorite places in this country. Um, Outside of the U.S., uh, Myanmar is probably one of my favorite destinations I've ever visited. Uh, Thailand is, a, is especially good for beginner travelers. Um, Thailand is where I would go when I was tired of traveling and I would want to, like, go home. I'd go to Thailand um, because it's just it's so comfortable and beautiful and just 
really nice. Uh, it's it's hard to pick favorites. It's you know which has been your favorite. What's your favorite pet? Um, what's your favorite dog or cat? You know they're they're sort of they're every place that you visit is a part of you. Uh, but Bali is another favorite. Uh, you know another place that I would readily go back to at the drop of a hat. Flores, um, I absolutely loved. Uh, Western Australia, um, particularly anywhere north of Perth, um, around Broome, um, all the way up through Darwin, I, is just fantastic. I love it for all the same reasons that I love southwestern U.S., um, Tasmania. And I have to ask, because mm -hmm. this this drives me bonkers, how do you deal with those long flights? Because it sounds like all these places are pretty far away. I mean, I know, you know, once you're over maybe in Europe or Asia to get to another place there isn't as long, but at some point or other you're taking a big flight. Yeah, um, you just deal with it. You know, you know that it'll be over in 24 to 36 hours. So... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it helps, like, what you were talking about, you, you know, when you're talking about, like, going for a longer period of time. If you know yeah. you're, you know, if if it's 24 hours and you're going to turn around and come back in a week, that's one thing. But if it's, you're going to exactly. be going for, you know, four weeks or a couple of months, then that's a little different. Exactly. Exactly. All right. I think we've gone over... <laughs> global travel pretty well and, um, and and basically how to make that happen if you want to. Um, one thing we like to do here is we like to do a, a final word um, where we just kind of sum up our thoughts and we go around and everybody gets a shot at it. So um, uh, Miranda, what's your final words on global travel and doing it on a budget? <laughs> um, I, um, I, I think it goes back to figuring out what's important to you and what you want to do. A lot of people are like, oh, I want to travel, but then you go and you look and see where they're spending their money, and it's really obviously not something that they're thinking about. Um, you know, I I like to travel, and so I do. I go on two or three trips a year, um, you know, bigger trips, and then I go on, like, smaller getaways or day trips throughout the year as well. And that's something my son and I like to do, and that's something that we make a priority. I mean, even my son saves up. Because he's like, oh, I want to be able to buy souvenirs. And so, I mean, he's he's looking ahead and saying, you know, I want to be able to spend this money when I travel. And so I think it, it goes back to, you know, well, what's really important to you and where are you spending your money? And then it, it kind of shows. And, Tom, what's your final word on traveling globally on a budget? Uh, my favorite tip is probably the, the first thing Paula said was D don't pay for your airfare. Uh, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, using points where I can. Uh, if I do have to pay for a flight, I, I save those flights for uh, the business expenses. Uh, if I'm going for a conference or anything like that, pay for those ones and let the personal trips be the ones that I, I use the points on. And uh, so I've never, yeah, it's been years where I've actually had to pay my own real money for a personal trip. <laughs> And Paul, what's your final word on, on traveling globally on a budget? Go, just go do it. Um, you know, realize that you can you can afford it. Traveling is affordable for almost anyone, and it's not as if you haven't done it before. It's not as scary as it's probably being built up in your head. So, um, and and traveling is a skill. So the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. Good advice. So for those people who are out there that might not be familiar with Afford Anything and, and what you do online, can you give them a little bit of a, a, a taste of what you're doing out there? Sure. Um, so Afford Anything is a site, as I said, it's based on the idea that you can afford anything but not everything. And so it deals a lot with uh, the themes of ruthlessly prioritizing, um, living your dreams, living out your epic adventure. It's not a blog that obsesses over penny pinching. Um, it instead really talks, uh, has a message that that you can achieve freedom and if you want to quit your day job you can do that. If you want to um, obtain total financial freedom you can do that. If you want to travel the world you can do that. And so uh, it's it's very much centered around that that idea that um, you, you don't have to follow the standard traditional advice of shackling yourself to a cubicle for 40 years. Um, you can live a bigger, bolder adventure than you may have ever thought possible. 
Paul, thank you for joining us. Um, your tips and stories have been they've been awesome and insightful. And thank you, everybody out there, for joining us at the Money Mastermind Show. Uh, until next week, be good with your money. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us on the Money Mastermind Show. Get more information at moneymastermindshow.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube and follow us on Google+.